Hello, everyone. Lantern Jack here from the Ancient Greece Declassified podcast. King Darius of Persia was one of the great military commanders of antiquity, and his campaign against the Scythians, which you'll hear about today from Ryan, ranks as one of the great military adventure stories of the ancient world. In projecting military force on three continents, Darius was following the footsteps of his two predecessors, Cyrus the Great and Cambyses, both of whom solidified their rule through conquest. Now, from our vantage point of history today, with our 2020 hindsight vision, it seems that for the Persian Empire to keep churning out these enterprising conqueror kings one after the other wasn't exactly a sustainable business model. Eventually, this relentless growth through conquest would have to slow down or, more likely, crash against something. And you'll hear about these crashes in the next several episodes of this podcast. We're talking some of the most famous wars in history, and I'll be listening along with you guys to Ryan's telling of the Persian Wars. Coincidentally, on my podcast this week, my guest is historian and archaeologist Ian Morris of Stanford University, and we're also going to be talking about the Persian Wars. Morris studies history using cutting-edge economic, demographic, and historical models, and I'll be asking him about the economies and technologies of the Persians and their Greek adversaries. And we're going to see if this kind of data science meets archaeology approach can add any insights to our understanding of the Greco-Persian conflict. So, for now, sit back and enjoy the show on Darius's campaigns, and stay tuned for upcoming episodes on the Persian Wars right here. And if you find yourself curious for more information, come on over to the Ancient Greece Declassified podcast, available at all the usual places and at greasepodcast.com, and check out our Persian War episode. That should be out in a few days, and uh, there's other episodes you can also browse, each delving into a different topic, from the Bronze Age collapse to the music of Sappho. And now, your feature presentation. Hello, and welcome back to the History of Ancient Greece, Episode 34, Rising Tensions. Cyrus founded the Persian Empire by conquering the Medes, Lydians, and Babylonians. Cambyses then completed the Near Eastern conquests by securing the empire's southern flank with the subjugation of Egypt. And so, with the empire's eastern flank secure at the Indus Valley, northern conquest held great importance to Darius, not only for himself personally, but for his legacy. After returning from the Indus Valley in 515 BC, he spent the next three years preparing for his European expedition. The Thracians and Scythians were warlike, and their countries are mountainous, so this Persian undertaking demanded large forces and careful precautions. In 515 BC, one of Darius's wives, Atossa, the daughter of Cyrus, developed a tumor on her breast. She had ignored it at first, but then it began to quickly spread. When Demosthenes cured her, as a reward, she pledged that she would convince her husband to allow him to visit his homeland. And so, honoring her pledge, Atossa set out to go Darius into attacking Greece, because Darius would take Demosthenes as a counselor along with him, and thus he would get to visit his homeland. I ventured that this is not exactly what Demosthenes had in mind, but here we are. Darius, though, had already began plans to invade the Scythians across the Hellespont, so he agreed to first send spies to Greece along with Demosthenes, to learn everything they can ahead of time. He made Demosthenes promise that he would return to Susa and even gave him rich, luxurious presents to give to his kinsfolk. And the nobles who accompanied him were privately charged to see that he did not escape. Well, let's see how that works out. And so, the next day, 15 Persians plus Demosthenes, as well as the ship crews, went off on a reconnaissance mission on three Phoenician ships. Herodotus does not state where in Greece they went only saying that they sailed along the coast and made observations. I would imagine it would have been somewhere along the Attic or Peloponnesian coastline. 
Anyways, afterwards they sailed to Italy and went ashore to Taros, where Demosthenes made his escape, with the help from their tyrant, Aristophilides, who had arrested the Persians on suspicions of spying, but not Demosthenes. He let the Persians go, though, but not until Demosthenes was already back at Croton. The Persians then sailed to Croton after Demosthenes. They managed to find him in the Agora and seized him, but a Crotonian mob started beating the Persians over the heads with a stick, and so they threaten that the great king will come after them next, before ultimately sailing back home to Persia. But along the way, they were shipwrecked on the coast of Iapkia and enslaved there. But a Tarentine exile named Gelos managed to rescue them and brought them back to Darius. Thankful for what he did, as a reward, Gilos sought help from Darius in being returned from exile to Taros. But Darius was not able to accomplish that without going to war with the Tarentines, something that he was not in the position to do. That would have been an interesting dynamic, though, if a Persian army had invaded southern Italy while the Romans and Etruscans were about to be embroiled in their mess, and the Greeks and Carthaginians with theirs in Sicily. Italy would have been quite the military hotbed. Anyways, to round out the story, Demosthenes finally received his desire to return to his homeland, and he even went on to marry the daughter of Milo, the famous wrestler and pupil of Pythagoras. Sometime after this, in 515 BC, the previously exiled brother of Polycrates, named Silasen, arrived at Susa to meet with Darius. Apparently, after he was exiled, he traveled to Egypt, where the two of them met in Memphis during the reign of Cambyses. Silasen at the time was wearing a bright red cloak, and Darius approached him with an offer to buy it. Silasen, though, ingratiated himself with Darius by giving him the cloak as a gift, free of charge. Well, when he found out that Dariusin was now the king of the Persians, he traveled to Susa to see the great king. Darius offered him gold and silver in return for his kindness in the past, but Silasen refused, and instead requested military support in overthrowing Samos' current ruler, a lowborn man named Myandrios. He was the same Myandrios that Polycrates first sent to inspect the gold at Magnesia, mentioned two episodes ago. Darius agreed, having been tempted by the prospect of there being a Samian tyrant that he could control, and dispatched the Persian fleet under Otanes, with the precise instructions not to kill any Samian or enslave anyone, but to give back Samos to Silasen without inflicting any harm, as he wanted the Samians not to have hatred for him. Back at Samos, Myandrios was holding rule, but had decided to give back power to the Samians and establish a democracy. Herodotus here uses the word isonomia, which means equality under the law. He would then retire and assume the priesthood of Zeus. But he was criticized as being lowborn, as he was not from the noble classes. Realizing that if he relinquished power now, one of these power-hungry nobles would surely make himself tyrant, so he decided not to give up his power and withdrew to the Acropolis instead. All those who questioned him were imprisoned. Myandrius, though, then fell ill, and his brothers, like Coretos and Caraelios, expecting that he would die, killed all of the prisoners in order to secure their possession of Samos, with less resistance. So this was the political situation when Silasen and the Persian fleet arrived at Samos. Seeing that he was in the weaker position, Myandrius was ready to leave the island under a truce, but his brothers refused and wanted to resist the Persians. So while Myandrios sailed away with Samos, the two brothers armed all of the mercenaries, opened up the gates, and let them loose on the Persians, who, believing that they had secured an agreement of total compliance, expected nothing like this to happen. The Persian nobles were chopped down, but when the rest of the Persian army arrived, the mercenaries were pushed back and confined on the Acropolis. An enraged Titanes, apparently forgetting the orders that Darius had given him about doing no harm to the Samians, then ordered his troops to kill every man, woman, and child alike in Samos. Meanwhile, in desperation, Myandrios had sailed to Sparta with a huge pile of gold and silver cups to bribe Cleomenes to send Spartan aid. Although Cleomenes was amazed at the splendidness of the cups, he had to send him away, and realizing he would try to bribe other Spartans, he went to the ephors and asked them to banish Myandrios, to which they agreed. In the end, the Persians were victorious and Silasen was installed as tyrant, but at the cost of many Samian lives. Later, though, the city was repopulated, thanks to Atanes, because apparently he had a disease which attacked his genitals. This is what Herodotus says, I'm not sure how one makes the connection between genital diseases to repopulate in a city, 
but alas, that is Herodotus for you. Anyways, hearing what had happened at Samos, it didn't take long for the Greeks of the Eastern Aegean to become fearful of Darius' intentions. Atanes reported back to Darius that many Greek polis were already considering making the symbolic tribute of earth and water, news that Darius received gladly. Thus, under the policy of Darius, tyrannies were being granted to many prominent Greek leaders who had pledged their polis in Persia's name, and many coastal cities and islands began to ally themselves with the Persians, even notoriously independent Miletus, which was now governed by a pro-Persian tyrant named Histiaeus. For Miltiades, who as we have discussed in episode 26, and who was ruling a small and vulnerable Athenian territory in Thrace, at the remote edge of Greek influence, this trend was worrisome. And in 513 BC, this threat became a reality. Messengers arrived with the news that Darius had decided to extend his rule over the Thracian Chersonese, and wanted to invite Miltiades to assist him in subduing the troublesome Scythian tribes, north of the Danube River, along the northwestern shores of the Black Sea, in modern Bulgaria, which was just north of the Greek territory of Thrace. Miltiades had no choice but to accept both of these. Thus, he brought his forces to link up with the Persians at the Bosporus Strait, where hundreds of thousands of troops marched across the narrow channel over a makeshift bridge of Phoenician and Greek triremes. Miltiades was left with little doubt that the great king had finally turned his attention westward, although Herodotus later characterized the Scythians as backwards barbarians, since they weren't Greek. There is no evidence to suggest that they had ever been a direct threat to the Greek colonies of the Black Sea coast, so this war was purely a Persian affair and Darius couldn't make any credible claims that he was aiding the Greeks against a common foe. Meanwhile, in preparation for his campaign against Scythia, Darius sent messengers around his kingdom, requesting troops for his army. His brother Artabanos pleaded with him not to follow through on this expedition, as he thought he would get mired down with the Scythians, and they'd become impossible to deal with. Ultimately, his pleas fell on deaf ears, and his army began to gather at Susa. One of the Persians, a man named Oibazus, asked Darius if he could leave behind one of his three sons, presumably to ensure his family name would continue if something were to happen to the other two. Darius said sure, and in fact released all three for military service. But as the army was marching off, the three sons had their throats cut. This story was clearly inserted by Herodotus to illustrate the cruelty of Persian kings and to contrast Oriental despotism with Greek freedom, an overarching motif of his work. When Darius arrived at Chalcedon, he led the first Persian army into Europe, ever, over the Hellespont by means of pontoon bridges, or boats hitched together for passage way over water, the first recorded use of this in the west. It had been planned and built under the supervision of Mandrocles of Samos. He was able to connect one side of the Hellespont to the other by scuttling boats side by side to and from the foundation. Then they built a highway across the top, linking Asia to Europe. It probably was a system of planks and underneath would have been a system of packed earth or dry wood to keep the road stable. To keep the ships from wobbling, they must have used an anchor system of a certain weight. If it was too heavy, it would have, of course, tilted or damaged the ships. There was no breaking of the planks, not only due to the weight of the army crossing it, but also due to the choppy waters of the Hellespont. That's quite a feat of engineering for their time, and it allowed the bulk of the Persian army to travel over land while the navy transported others and supplies via the sea. Once on the other side at Byzantium, Darius erected two stelae made of white stone, one engraved with Assyrian writing, and the other with Greek, listing all of the peoples who had contributed to the army that he was leading. Herodotus states that these two stelae were seen by him. They may not have been found, but obviously it was erected as propaganda. Herodotus records that on the stelae it read his army and cavalry numbered 700,000, with 600 ships. This is clear exaggeration. Furthermore, Darius rewarded him handsomely for his services, and Mandrocles used that money to dedicate a monument at the Temple of Hera at Samos, in honor of Darius's crossing of Europe. On it, Darius was seated in a prominent place as his army crosses the bridge. These four verses were inscribed. Having bridged the fishy Bosporus, Mandrocles dedicated to Hera a memorial of his raft bridge a crown he set upon his own head, and glory upon the men of Samos, for the work he wrought pleased King Darius. And so the iconography here is clear. In order to get to the Scythians, Darius had to pass through Thrace, the land north of Greece, famous for its tough warriors. 
The Thracians, though, had their own problems with the Scythians. So while they did not welcome the Persian intrusion, they didn't halt their advance either. They quickly found out, though, the Persians also intended to subdue their region. Very little details of the warfare in Thrace are preserved. Herodotus reports that many tribes submitted. The only tribe Herodotus reports that didn't surrender were the Getai, who lived above Apollonia and Mesembria. Considering their warlike nature, it seems highly probable that other tribes didn't go down without a fight either. Anyways, Darius then continued his trek north to the Danube River, called the Ister by the Greeks. Meanwhile, his fleet had sailed through the Hellespont up to the western Black Sea coast to the mouth of the Danube and were instructed to sail down the river for two days to where the mouth divides and there build another boat bridge. So when Darius and his army reached the Danube, his fleet was there waiting for him with a bridge already built. Darius then was counseled by Chios, the general of the Mytilenians, not to destroy the bridge, as Darius had originally planned, but to keep it up because he was about to lead an army into a land with no cultivatable lands and inhabited cities and may have the need to return over it. Darius agreed and then thanked him. And so he left all the Ionian Greek tyrants behind with their forces to defend the bridge across the Danube. He gave them a leather strap tied in 60 knots with the orders to untie one knot each day and after all 60 days had expired, they were to sail home to their own lands. After crossing the Danube and moving north into Scythian territory, Darius made his presence and his intentions known. And so all of the Scythian kings on the northern Black Sea shore, those being the Tarians, Agathirsoi, Nurians, the Man-Eaters, the Black Cloaks, Galonians, Budinoi, and Saramatai, met together to discuss their next course of action. Although they were an independent collection of tribes, they realized the threat that the Persians were to them and individually, they were incapable of repelling his massive army. Three of the tribes, the Galonians, Budnoi, and Saramatai, pledged their support to one another, while the other five decided to remain neutral. They argued that they had not wronged the Persians before, who were only here to get vengeance on those tribes that had, and they will not wrong them now. And with that, the meeting of the kings was dismissed. Those who agreed to fight the Persians were divided into two groups. One was led by Scopasus, of the Sarametai, and the other jointly by Idanthersos of the Galonians and Taxicus of the Budinoi. Scopasus' job was to retreat, and if the Persians turned in their direction, they were to flee along the coast of Lake Maeotis, the modern-day Sea of Azov, and head straight for the Tanais River, the modern Don River. Then, if the Persians turned back, they were to pursue and attack them. The other group was tasked to retreat directly towards the lands of those tribes who had rejected their alliance and forced them to go to war by any means necessary. After that had been accomplished, they were to turn back toward their own land and jointly attack the Persian army. When these plans were decided, they then loaded up their women and children and all of their livestock, except as much as they needed for their own survival, and sent them northwards, out of harm's way. And so Darius soon found that these Scythians employed the same frustrating tactics as those in the east. They had sent an advance guard of their best cavalry to spy on the Persian army, and once they determined their position, they began to devastate all of their crops, using the scorched earth technique and keeping their camp one day ahead of the Persians. When the Persians saw the Scythian horsemen, they tried to overtake them and chase them down their retreat path. As the Scythians slowly retreated eastward into more remote territories north of the Black Sea, in what is modern-day Ukraine, Darius relentlessly followed after them. When the Scythians crossed the Tanais River, the Persians crossed after them and continued their pursuit. When they came upon a large fortified city in the area of the Budinoi, they burned it to the ground. Finally, Darius ordered a halt and encamped his army at an uninhabited region by the Oeris River, the modern-day Volga River to the northeast of the Black Sea, in modern-day Russia. There, Herodotus reports that he began to build eight huge forts at about six miles apart from one another, although no traces of these forts have been identified. Regardless, this was as far eastward as Darius was willing to go. After chasing the Scythians for a month, Darius' army was suffering losses due to fatigue and sickness. But during this whole time, the Scythians outmaneuvered Darius by taking a roundabout course inland and turning back towards western Scythia. While Darius continued this wild goose chase along the northern Black Sea shoreline, the other group of Scythians were off, forcibly recruiting other tribes to join them. They were only successful with the Agathirsoi, though, 
as the other tribes decided to flee north as well. But as Darius pursued the first group of Scythians, they eventually passed the location of the second group. And so that group of Scythians joined in on the chase and began to attack the supply lines in the rear of the Persian forces, using guerrilla warfare tactics. In frustration, Darius sent a message to the Scythian king, Idanthyrsus, to quit being a coward and to either fight or recognize him as their master. Idanthyrsus responded that he would not stand and fight with Darius until they destroyed the graves of their fathers, and that Darius was powerless to compel him, since the Scythians had no cities for them to conquer or cultivated lands for them to forage. Apparently, though, the Scythians interpreted Cyrus wanting to be their master meant slavery, and so they became enraged and changed up their tactics. They sent the first Scythian division, led by Scopassus and the Sarometai, southwards with orders to hash out a deal with the Ionian Greeks defending the bridge against the Danube. Those left behind, led by Idan Thersos, resolved not to lead the Persians on a wild goose chase any longer, but to continue to harass them with guerrilla warfare tactics. Realizing that the Persians had grown flustered and disconcerted, and were on the verge of packing it in and heading back to Persia, the Scythians developed a plan to induce them to remain longer in Scythia, while their other detachment went to parley with the Ionians. They would leave some of the herd behind and stealthily go elsewhere. Then the Persians would go after the herds, seize them, and be encouraged by their success. At the same time, though, they would send their cavalry out to chase after the Persian cavalry. But since donkeys or mules were an uncommon sight in Scythia, at least according to Herodotus, the sounds made by the Persian donkeys and mules, as well as their appearance, would frighten the Scythian horses, which affected the outcome in that the Scythian cavalry was never able to rout the entrapped Persians. This happened over and over again until Darius at last found himself in an impossible situation. When Idin Thyrsos recognized this, he sent a herald to Darius bearing the following gifts. A bird a mouse, a frog, and five arrows. The herald added that the Persians would realize what the gifts meant if they were wise. And then the herald departed, and Darius considered the matter. He was of the opinion that the gifts meant that the Scythians were surrendering themselves, and this was their version of earth and water. But one of his advisors, Gobrius, who had been one of the Cabal of Seven, was of a different opinion. He reasoned that the gifts had the following significance, saying this, Persians, unless you turn into birds and fly up into the sky, or mice and descend underground, or frogs and hop into the lakes, you will be shot by these arrows and never return home. Realizing their peril and the hopelessness of their endeavor, Gabrius then advised Arias to sneak away in the middle of the night back to the Danube without the Scythians knowing it. They would accomplish this by lighting their campfires as usual and leaving behind a contingent of their weakest soldiers with all of their donkeys, so that they would continue to make noise and thus keep the Scythians from suspecting anything and attacking from their camp. And so Darius thought this was good advice and carried out this plan. Darius had told his weakest soldiers that they were being left behind to guard the camp, while the other soldiers go to battle the Scythians. When they realized that they had been betrayed by Darius, they immediately told the Scythians what had happened, and the Scythians at once went straight in pursuit for the Persians. Since the Persians were unfamiliar with the roads, if you can call them that, the Scythians were able to take shortcuts and reach the Danube before the Persians. Meanwhile, the other Scythian division had already arrived at the Danube. They offered a large payment to the Ionian Greeks if they would destroy the bridge and trap Darius's army, which would allow the Scythians to continue their harassment of the Persians until fatigue, disease, and starvation would force them to surrender. Miltiades of Athens, the tyrant of the Thracian Chersonies, argued forcefully that this needed to be done because if Darius wasn't stopped now, his next target clearly would be Greece. Histiaeus of Miletus conceded this is probably the case, but argued that realistically the Persians couldn't be stopped, and they shouldn't anger the great king, since he has left their territories unmolested. Furthermore, they owed their power to him. If he were killed, they would face their own exile or death by their home cities. Although everyone had initially favored the opinion of Miltiades, Histiaeus' argument switched their support to his side. Since Darius would let Miltiades remain in control of the Thracian Chersonese after the Scythian campaign, most scholars do not believe that he actually took an anti-Persian stance at the bridge. It was probably just Herodotus rewriting history to make it neat and tidy because of the role Miltiades will play in the later Persian wars. After a majority of the tyrants voted to remain loyal, 
Histiaeus devised a plan to aid the Persians by giving false information to the Scythians, who were now all together on the banks of the Danube. He said that the Ionians agree with them and will tear the bridge down, but they would only tear down a small portion of the bridge. Witnessing the bridge being disassembled, the Scythians turned back to search for the Persians. But the Persians had concealed their tracks well and were able to make it to the Danube and cross the bridge without the Scythians noticing. When they arrived, Histiaeus organized a speedy and efficient ferry of his army across the river to the safety of Thrace. They then tore down the bridge completely. Impressed by his loyalty and capability, Darius promised a reward to Histiaeus when they get back to Sardis. Herodotus's account of Darius's Scythian campaign, which has a large Persian army marching from the Ister River, the modern Danube, to the Tanais River, the modern Don, and back in just over 60 days, is a logistical impossibility. The real aim of the campaign seems to have been to conquer Thrace and the Getae, and thus gain access to the gold-producing areas of Transylvania. This seems to be evident because a clay tablet written in old Persian cuneiform script was found at Gerala in northern Transylvania, whose text records Darius's establishment of a palace or administrative building there. It is also conceivable that Herodotus' account conflates two different Scythian campaigns, one of Darius in the western Pontic area against the Getae and the western Scythian tribes and another associated with the area of Lake Maeotis in North Caucasus. Stesia, a Greek physician at the Persian court at the turn of the 5th century BC, and the author of a work called Persica, records that Darius at one point had ordered the satrap of Cappadocia, Arya Ramnes, to launch an expedition by sea with 30 Pentaconters against the Scythians, returning with Scythian men and women, including the brother of a Scythian king but the date and circumstances of this campaign are not recorded. With all that being said, we really aren't sure how this campaign, or campaigns, if that's the case, actually went about. We can only guess at his motives here as well. In strategic terms, Darius must have seen that some Scythian tribes extended from Ukraine all the way to what is now modern-day Uzbekistan, forming a continuum of dangerous nomadic raiders. Some scholars have supposed that the mere intent of Darius's invasions was to destroy the Scythian lands and thus eliminate them as a threat. The erection of a bridge over the Hellespont, however, contradicts this. If he simply wanted to lay waste to a land, his superior fleet could have easily shipped his troops over as the Scythians had no navy at all. Instead, he chose to make the long march across the Hellespont through Thrace into Scythia, probably partly as a symbolic gesture of showing off his large army and who he was. But his aim wasn't to destroy but to win over the people of the Black Sea region in order to gain control of the source of Scythian exports of gold, grain, hides, and fur for the Persian Empire. Although Darius inflicted widespread damage on the Scythians and upset the balance of power among the various tribes of the Ukraine, he failed to bring the Scythians to battle, he was unable to secure any territorial gains, and he did not even complete the building of the forts at what could have been a frontier. The campaign was little more than an expensive stalemate. As winter now had come, Darius did not return to attack, and so he marched southwards towards Thrace in order to firmly secure his territories. Some form of Persian authority perhaps remained after Darius's withdrawal, for the Scythians across the sea are mentioned at Persepolis as one of the peoples the king conquered outside of Persia. This could just be hollow propaganda, though and it's likely that Persian rule did not extend beyond the Danube River in any strength. Darius marched his army southward through Thrace down to Sestos on the Chersonese, where he crossed the Hellespont to winter in Sardis over 513-512 BC. He left behind 80,000 troops on the European side of the strait under the command of his most trusted general, Megabazus. The Scythian heartland may have been out of reach for Darius, but all of Thrace would make a nice consolation prize. Having conquered a portion of northeastern Thrace already, in the spring of 512 BC, Megabasis was charged with conquering southern Thrace along the northern Aegean coastline. Divided into numerous tribes, with no overarching political organization, they were powerless to resist the Persian assault. First to fall to Megabasis was Perinthus. Herodotus doesn't give much detail about this Thracian conquest like he did the Persian conquest of Ionia. But Megabasis systematically marched westward along the coast as each tribe surrendered one by one to his army. 
By 511 BC, Megabasis had accomplished his goal and Thrace was absorbed into the westernmost Persian satrapy. Meanwhile, while Darius was at Sardis, two events occurred worth mentioning. First, he summoned Histiaeus of Miletus to his court and offered him a gift of his own choosing for helping him cross the Danube. He asked for permission to found a city, to be called Merkinos, in Thrace, on fertile land near the Strymon River, and Darius permitted this. Thus, he was forced to pass the tyranny of Miletus down to his son-in-law, Aristagoras. We will come across Aristagoras in the very near future. Second, Darius chanced upon a woman from Paeonia, the region directly north of Macedon and to the northwest of the Halkidiki Peninsula. She was extremely beautiful and could walk with a jug on her head, while also guiding a horse by a rein and spinning flax, all at the same time. Apparently, she roused Darius' curiosity because he had never seen someone work so efficiently and as hard before. We have mentioned how Darius is the ultimate bureaucrat, so this should come to no surprise. He asked the woman if all the women back in Paeonia worked just as hard as she did. She said yes, and so Darius wrote a letter to Megabasis, instructing him to make war on the Paeonians and bring all of their women and children back to him. Well, Megabasis received this letter right when he was wrapping up his Thracian campaign, and so he led his armies westward and then northward along the Strymon River. When the Paeonians learned that the Persians were advancing against them, they mustered an army and marched down the river towards the sea. Receiving this intelligence in advance, Megabasis decided to outwit the Paeonians and turned inland with the help of guides and attacked the various Paeonian cities. They were captured one by one and were shipped back to Darius. Those in the Pangaean Mountains and who lived around Lake Preseus, though, were not subdued. Immediately to the west was the kingdom of Macedon, which was currently under the rule of Amyntas, who reigned from 540 to 498 BC. We will cover the history of Macedon in much greater detail in a future episode, but at this point, they were a small fractured kingdom. They had no lost love either for the Thracians or Scythians, but after hearing reports about what just transpired to their neighbors to the east, when Persian messengers arrived at his court in 510 BC, Amyntas offered unconditional support to the Persian king, meaning he gave earth and water to join the Persian Empire as a client state instead of being conquered. At the celebratory banquet, the Persian envoys demanded that Macedonian women be present, since that was what they were accustomed to back in Persia. Even though it was against Macedonian custom to have women in the presence of men, Amyntas didn't want to anger his new Persian masters, and so he acquiesced. The Persians, though, got good and drunk, and eventually began to aggressively fondle the breasts and kiss on the Macedonian women. Amyntas didn't say anything as to not upset the Persians, but his young son, the crowned prince Alexandros, was overwhelmed with indignation and told his elder father that he should go to bed and he would oversee the rest of the banquet. Amyntas agreed, but told his son not to do anything rash and to let cooler heads prevail. Alexandros, though, didn't heed the advice of his father, and he set forth a plan in motion to get revenge. He told the Persians that the ladies needed to go back and shower up, and would come meet them in their rooms for a little intercourse. Completely drunk and horny, the Persians went back to their rooms and waited for what they thought was going to be their second Macedonian conquest. But Alexandros had a different idea. He found some smooth-chinned young men, passed them off as ladies by dressing them up in women's clothing, and sending them into the Persians' quarters with the daggers concealed. And so these men, as well as all of their servants, were stabbed to death. Their murders were concealed, though. Herodotus does not mention it, but I would imagine that Alexandros must have gotten rid of the body somehow. When Megabysis launched an intensive search to find his missing men, Alexandros bribed the man in charge, a Persian named Buberis, with a large amount of money, in addition to his own sister, Gygea, to stop this investigation. Now richer and with a new wife, he then reported back that the Persian envoys must have gotten lost on their way back from Macedonia. This story is most likely fanciful, as there is no way that the murder of Persian envoys would have gone unavenged. Regardless, with the addition of Macedon, Persian power now extended to the foothills of Mount Olympus. At this point, the Persian invasion of Europe came to a halt. Considering the ease in which they moved westward across the Aegean, it is not clear why they didn't continue to push forward. It's likely that Darius received good intelligence from the Ionian Greeks and thus decided meticulous planning was needed before he attempted to invade Greece. 
Also, Darius may have also believed that time was firmly on his side. More Greeks were pledging loyalty to him, without him even having to fight, even within major Greek polis. As powerful pro-Persian factions were forming, convinced of the inevitability and desirability of Persian rule, given time, he may have believed that all of Greece might drop into his hand without lifting a finger. At the same time, as Megabasis was leading an army through the northern Aegean, military happenings were taking place in northern Africa. In the last episode, we discussed how Arcesilus III was murdered in the Cyrenian town of Barque, while afterwards his mother, Feratime, fled to Egypt, where she begged for help from the Persian satrap, Ariandes, in avenging her son's death, claiming that he was killed because of his Medism, since he had agreed to give earth and water to Cambyses. Ariandes decided to help her and dispatched his entire Egyptian military force, whose land forces were led by Amasis, not to be confused with the previous Egyptian pharaohs, and the fleet by Bardas. When they arrived at Barque, they laid siege to the city, demanding the surrender of those responsible for Arcesilus' murder. But they refused, and so the Persians besieged the city and launched violent assaults on the walls. Finally, the city fell after nine months. Feratime had all of the city's men be impaled in a circle around the wall, and the women had their breasts cut off, and those two were placed in intervals around the wall. These breastless women and the children were then taken off as captives, and were sent to Darius, who then resettled them in the territory of Bactria. Herodotus reports that Feratime soon afterwards died of worms, which teemed her body and crawled out from it while she still lived because the gods punished her for executing vengeance so violently and excessively. Meanwhile, as Megabasis was leading the Persian army back to Sardis, presumably with the Paeonian women and children still, he learned that Histiaeus of Miletus was building fortifications along the Strymon River at Myrkinus, the site which he had received from Darius as a reward. Myrkinus was in the neighborhood of silver mines, and there was abundance of wood suitable for shipbuilding. So the Persian general thought it would be imprudent to allow a Greek colony to be planted in such an advantageous position. Well, when he arrived at Sardis in 510 BC, he handed the Paeonians over to Darius, who no doubt was ecstatic about this and all that Megabasis had accomplished in the northern Aegean. But he then expressed his concerns for what Histiaeus was doing, saying, Sire, just think of what you have done. You gave a dangerously clever Greek permission to found a city for himself in Thrace where timber is abundant for construction of ships and oars, where there are also silver mines and multitudes of both Hellenes and barbarians. As soon as these people find a leader, they will follow his orders day and night. So put an end to what this man is doing, and thus avoid being afflicted by war within your own territory. Send for him and stop him, but treat him gently, and when you have him in your grasp, see to it that he never returns to the territory of the Hellenes. And so Darius trusted the advice of his general, and sent a messenger to Myrkonos, requesting that Histiaeus accompanies him back to Susa to join his royal court as a trusted advisor, an honor that Histiaeus couldn't refuse. Darius then appointed Artaphernes, his half-brother, to the same father, to be the satrap of Sardis, and he, Megabasis, and Histiaeus rode off to Susa. He also appointed Atanes to take over command of the forces stationed along the coast. At some point in the last decade of the 500s BC, he captured many places in and near the Hellespont. He took Byzantium and Chalcedon, as well as Antandros and Lampania in the Troad. Then he obtained ships from the people of Lesbos and took Lemnos and Imbros. With the exception of these deeds of Atanes in the west, the last decade of the 6th century BC remains mysteriously silent for Persia. Scholars are tempted to fill in the blanks with the standard consolidation, administration, and undocumented eastern campaigns, but we don't really know what was going on. By this time, it is estimated that 50 million people, or 45% of the world's population, lived under Darius's rule, making the Persian Empire the largest in history, in terms of the percentage of world population. In terms of land, it encompassed some 1 million square miles, spanning three continents. What was clear, though, was that this empire was huge and powerful and had encroached right up to the very borders of Greece itself, and they very quickly would become an ally or an enemy to various Greek polis. As we mentioned in episode 27, fresh off their democratic reforms, Athens turned to Persia as an ally against the Spartans. An Athenian delegation arrived at Sardis in the summer of 507 BC, where they met Artaphernes. According to Herodotus, 
When the envoys spoke according to their instructions, Artaphernes asked the Athenian ambassadors to give the customary donation of earth and water. The ambassadors, not knowing the symbolism of what they were doing, agreed to this request. Now that they were a subject of Persia, they had the right to request aid in their conflict with the Spartans. Artaphernes said that he would help, but only if they put down their new government and install Hippias as a satrap of Athens, like what was the norm for the rest of the Greek polis in Asia Minor at that time. Hippias had courted favor with Artaphernes after he was exiled. Naturally, having just rid themselves of the former tyrant, the ambassadors responded with a resounding no and left abruptly for Athens, which as you can expect, greatly angered Artaphernes. And for the next decade, Hippias missed no opportunity to slander the Athenians to Artaphernes and did all that he could to bring about Athens' complete and total submission to himself and the Persians. Once the Athenian envoys had returned home, the men of the Ecclesia, although outraged at their envoys' symbolic submission to a foreign power, never overtly repudiated the alliance and never sent another embassy to Artaphernes to announce that Athens was unilaterally dissolving the pact. In the aftermath of this fumbled diplomacy, the Athenians continued to think of themselves as independent and unencumbered by any obligation to the Persian king. Their refusal of Artaphernes' command, though, meant that Athens had technically just entered into a state of war with Persia, though at the time, it wasn't really seen in those terms. Darius, for his part, had no indication that the relationship had changed. As far as he knew, the Athenians remained voluntarily allied to him and still owed him the loyalty and deference that all his subjects paid. But Athenian actions would soon change his perspective. The last few years of the 6th century BC were a welcome calm before the coming storm. Sparta's expansionist ambitions beyond the Peloponnese had been temporarily curtailed after Cleomenes' failed attempts to restore both Isagoras and Hippias as tyrants. In Athens, enthusiastic converts to the new democracy rubbed elbows with the resentful former elites. Unsatisfied with the new order, a growing number of Eupatridae began to solicit Persian aid in overturning the revolution. In response, the Democrats smeared them by calling them Medizers. Although tension clearly had been rising in the Greek polis about the Persian threat, war between the Greeks and the Persians may not have been a foregone conclusion, as it might seem. In the case of Persian official dealings with the Greeks, a rare piece of epigraphic evidence, now housed in the Louvre, goes in precisely the opposite direction. The text in question was cut into a marble block in the 2nd century AD at Magnesia on the Maianda River in Ionia probably at the instigation of priestly authorities, keen to establish publicly the sacredness of the land at issue. But there is every reason to think that the document is an authentic copy of an imperial order of a Darius, originally delivered to Gadatus, the satrap of Phrygia, sometime around 500 BC. It reads, The king of kings, Darius, son of Hystaspus, speaks to Gadatus, his slave, thus, I find that you are not completely obedient to my orders because you are cultivating my land, transplanting fruit trees from the province beyond the Euphrates, meaning Syria, Palestine, to the western Asiatic regions. I praise your purpose, but because my religious dispositions are nullified by you, I shall give you proof of a wronged king's anger, unless you change your ways. For the gardeners sacred to Apollo have been made to pay tribute to you, and the land that is not sacred they have dug up at your command. You are ignorant of my ancestors' attitude to the god, who told the Persians all of the truth. Darius here was coming to the rescue of the Greeks, and his tactful reference to his ancestors would have been music to a Greek subject's ears, since according to Greek tradition, they honored their gods, kata ta patria, or in accordance with the things of the fathers, and was of the essence of their custom and belief. He too appreciated the distinction between the sacred and the not-so-sacred, between precincts cut off as special places for their gods and land that had not been sanctified and sacralized. They would have found Darius' toleration of a foreign Greek cult entirely congenial and culturally familiar too. And so the evidence seems to suggest that the Persians and the Greeks may have not had to go to war after all. The Persian conquest of Thrace and the submission of Macedon was a step, though not necessarily an intentional step, towards a Persian attempt to conquer Greece. That attempt on Greece would not be made until more than 20 years later, and for the first 12 years after the return of Darius from Thrace, nothing occurred, or at least nothing is recorded, which seemed likely to bring on a great struggle with the two. 
Darius respected the customs of the Ionian Greeks, and he didn't seem to hold any ill will against them. In fact, he held a very good relationship with those in Ionia, and it's quite possible that this relationship may have quenched his desire for further conquest. Maybe Macedonia was the furthest extent westward that he envisioned his empire, and he was content to share a peaceful border with the mainland Greeks. Then again, maybe the war was inevitable, because the Ionian Greeks would continue to pine for their freedom, regardless of how well the Persian king treated them. We just don't know. The almost lack of information on the political happenings in Greece, from 505 to 500 BC, might suggest, as we mentioned in episode 26, that maybe Cleisthenes and the Alcmeonidae had Medes, and the record was later wiped clean to hide the fact. Regardless, serious problems would arise at the turn of the century, and Athens would continue to find itself in hot water with the Persians, until finally, war was unequivocally inevitable. But the spark for war happened in an unexpected place, and because of an unexpected person. It happened at Miletus, and thanks to Histiaeus, the former tyrant turned advisor to Darius and his nephew, Aristagoras. So join me next time on the History of Ancient Greece, Episode 35, The Ionian Revolt. If you haven't done so yet, please head on over to iTunes and rate and review the show. It would help the podcast grow immensely. Also, while you're there, subscribe to the show so it comes on your phone or listening device every week. If you don't have iTunes, you can catch the show on SoundCloud, Stitcher, or Google Play. Also, make sure you're checking out the website at thehistoryofancientgreece.com, where I've posted a lot of neat supplementary photos, maps, and charts for each episode. Finally, now that the show has gained some traction, I decided to create a Patreon page in case anyone felt inclined to contribute to the creation of the History of Ancient Greece podcast. There is a link on the right-hand side of the website. But don't worry, the podcast will still remain free regardless, but it is an expensive endeavor to create a podcast after all with the cost of website hosting and the purchasing of equipment and the time and effort required to research, write, record, and edit a show. So if you're feeling generous, consider supporting the show by making a monthly donation. If you'd rather just do a one-time donation, there is also a PayPal link on the right-hand side of the website. Just click on the Donate button. Patreon allows you to pledge money, either for every episode or per month. It can be as little as a dollar a month if you please. That amounts to a can of soda or a cup of tea or coffee a month. And while it may seem insignificant, if many people pledge that amount, it can really add up quickly. Either way, I would be eternally grateful. Speaking of which, I would like to give a huge thanks to listener Al Ozanoff, Andrea Peterson, Patrick G., and Alex for their pledges. I cannot tell you enough how thankful I am for your support. And once again, thanks to everyone else for your continued support in making this podcast, and I hope you enjoyed today's episode. I would like to give a special thanks to the amazing artist Michael Levy for allowing me to feature his music on this podcast. He transports you to the ancient world, bringing to life the melodies and using the techniques of the past. A new song will be played every episode. This one is titled Nephile, Nymphs of the Clouds, from his album The Lyre of Hermes. If you like what you heard and are curious to learn more about ancient Greek music, check out his website at ancientlyre.com. His albums are available in every major digital music store, including iTunes, Amazon, and Spotify. Thank you.